Good evening. I am grateful for the opportunity to worship with your church family and to teach from the Word of God. Tonight we're going to be looking at the book of Lamentations. Lamentations was probably written by the prophet Jeremiah at one of the lowest points in the history of Israel. In the year 586 BC, Jerusalem was utterly wiped out by the Babylonian Empire. People were massacred. Survivors were deported as slaves, prisoners. All of the civic and religious buildings were destroyed. The pitiful residents who remained were starving. Some of them ate their own children to survive. Dead bodies were lying in the streets. A lament is a cry of despair, grief, fear, and confusion. The Book of Lamentations contains five poems of despair and confusion. I'm going to read the first half of Jeremiah's third poem, Lamentations 3, 1 through 33. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps, tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. The Book of Lamentations speaks a 
about deep suffering. How? How do you keep going when things in life are sad and destroyed? Friends have left you, your country is ruined, your church is closed down. Those kinds of experiences and those kinds of feelings are described in Lamentations, chapters 1 and 2. Today we're going to look at Lamentations chapter 3, and we'll see three things, three things. First, how to endure terrible suffering. How to endure terrible suffering. Second, why we lose hope under terrible suffering. Why we lose hope under terrible suffering. And then three, the end of terrible suffering. So first, how to endure terrible suffering. God's people will endure terrible suffering. This includes those who are followers of Jesus. This is a central teaching in Christianity. For instance, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 1 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, Paul says, no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Christianity will tell you how to endure suffering in this life. Now some of you are suffering. Some of you are suffering now. Some of you may soon be suffering. Lamentations will give you words, words to pray to God when you are suffering, in your dark days. Verses 1 through 21 describe the terrible suffering, and then verses 22 to 33 tell us how to endure terrible suffering. Let's look at how Jeremiah describes terrible suffering. Verse 1, the cause of his suffering. Verse 1, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. His wrath. Jeremiah says his suffering was caused by God. Now this is offensive to some people. Sometimes God brings suffering because people have sinned, like in Lamentation. But sometimes God brings sufferings to people who have not sinned, as in the book of Job. Now, some people disagree that God could bring suffering. But here, in his own word, God says that he sometimes brings suffering into the lives of his people. Now, notice the type of suffering described. In the first two chapters of Lamentations, Jeremiah describes a suffering that's largely external to the speaker. He's seeing suffering. Suffering in society, the suffering of Jeremiah's neighbors, those around him. But then, chapter 3, Jeremiah describes suffering that is intensely personal, inside. Chapters 1 and 2 describe what God did to them. Chapter 3 describes what God did to me. What suffering has God imposed on Jeremiah? Verse 2, Jeremiah says... God brought dark days upon me. He's led me into this darkness. He has led me into this darkness. He has made me walk into this night. Verse 3, God's hand is against me. Why are things going wrong? Why? Because God's hand is against me. God is steering events to my harm not to my good. Verse 4 and 13, He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. Jeremiah feels that God has wrecked his health. He is making my body fall apart, maybe through cancer, 
maybe through infection, maybe through an accident. My body is a mess. Verse 5, he has besieged me. He has surrounded me with bitterness and woe. I'm surrounded by trouble and there is no solution. I can't fix my family. I can't fix my business, my job. God has put me in a no-win situation. Verse 6, he has set me in dark places like the dead. God depresses me. I'm alive, but I might as well be in the grave. Verse 7, God has closed all ways out. I have no way out from my trouble. Verse 8, even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayers. God will not hear my prayers. I pray, but God says no. I've asked for healing. I've asked for a spouse. I've prayed for my wandering child, but God says no. <laughs> Verse 9, he has blocked my ways with hewn stone. God, God trips me when I try to move forward. I'm trying to move out of my trouble, but God keeps pushing me back down the hill. Verses 10 and 11, he has been to me a bear, a lion. He has torn me to pieces. God is ripping me to shreds. My affliction, it's deep, it's scarring, it's traumatic. Verse 12, he has bent his bow and set me up as a target for his arrow. God is aiming at me. It seems like he is purposely targeting me for pain. Verse 14, people are making fun of me. They enjoy making fun of me. They talk about me. They mock me together. Verse 15, he has filled me with bitterness. He's made me drink wormwood. God makes me bitter. God, I have become a cynical person. Verse 17, God has removed any memory of happiness. Verse 18, I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Jeremiah is saying, I am losing my faith in the Lord. Verse 20, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. It's not a dream. When I wake up in the morning, things are just as bad as they were yesterday. Now, some of you have experienced this kind of torment. Maybe you know people who are in this kind of torment. If you are in this kind of affliction and trouble, how can you endure it? There's something interesting that you need to notice in verse 21. After Jeremiah tells us all about the suffering, this is what he says in verse 21. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Verse 21 connects all of this suffering in verses 1 through 21, to the hope in verse 22 and following. Your trouble is as deep as an ocean, but there is, there is hope. Your hope may seem very small, like a little twig amidst all of these churning waves. What, what is that hope? It's the mercy of of God, the mercy of God. Because of the mercy of God, we can endure with hope. Do you see the Lord's mercy, compassion, and faithfulness in these verses 22 through 24? That is where you will find the answer to your suffering. Verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great 
is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. It says here our God is merciful, compassionate, and faithful. Let's define God's mercy, compassion, and faithfulness. What, what is God's mercy? What is God's mercy? His mercy is his loving loyalty to you. God has made a serious promise to always support you. We can call it covenant loyalty. God is a husband that all husbands were meant to be. What is God's compassion? God is deeply moved, deeply moved with love when he looks at you. God's compassion is, is much, much greater than our, our fallen human emotion of love. God has compassion like a good father, like the best father, who is unchangeable in his love. He made us. He made us loved sons, loved daughters. And so when he sees us, when he sees you, he is moved with compassion for his children. And what is God's faithfulness? God can always be trusted. He can always be trusted in all times, all situations. Even your, even your father, even your mother will disappoint you. Maybe they already have. But your father heaven, he will not let you down. He is steadfast. Psalm 36, 5 says, Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. And that means the Lord has love and kindness for you today. And because of that, the Lord has more love more kindness for you tomorrow. Because he's great in faithfulness, you can expect that his mercy and his compassion, they will continue every day, each day of your life. But how do you put this together? How do you put this together with the great trouble, the great affliction that God brings in to your life? How can he love you when it feels like he's striking you, when he feels like he's piercing you. How can it be that he loves you when it feels like he is against you? you? You cannot, you cannot explain this in human relationship terms, you can't. We have started to, to step into the divine. God is wonderful, God is wonderfully beyond our understanding. But in baby talk, we can understand some. Verse 33, we see this. God does not willingly afflict nor grieve the children of men. Don't make the mistake of trying to fully understand how God can be a righteous judge who is also merciful and patient. There's no human analogy. God is fully righteous. God is fully love. God brings suffering into our lives. God does not willingly afflict us. God is not a philosophical system that you can piece together. If, if you try to solve all of these riddles, if you, if you treat God like he's a logic puzzle, you're going to find it maddening. You're going to find it frustrating. But if you, if you have come to know this God, know him, if God is your father, and Christ is your Lord, and Jesus is your friend, you don't need me to tell you any of this. This testimony is something that you've already come to know yourself. Here's something else that we know about our God. 
God ends suffering. God ends suffering. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Verse 31, for the Lord will not cast off forever. 32, though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion. Therefore, we endure suffering. and We wait in patient hope. Verse 36, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. How do we endure terrible suffering? Here is the answer in the text. Because of the unfailing mercy and compassion of God, we endure terrible suffering in hope. What is suffering for the Christian? What is suffering for the Christian? Suffering is waiting for God. Now the second thing, why we lose hope. Why we lose hope under terrible suffering. Well, how, how do you feel when you, when you hear me read these verses, verses 22 and 23? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. How do those words sound to you when your family is crumbling, falling apart, when, when you have another bill and it's just pushing you deeper into debt? We, we all tend to lose hope under terrible suffering. Why? Four reasons here, four reasons in the text. First of all, loneliness. Loneliness can fill us bitterness. Verse 28 says, let him sit alone. You might be lonely. You might be lonely because you live by yourself. Or you're lonely because the people all around you, they don't understand you. Verses 14, 15, Jeremiah says that instead of sympathy, he gets ridiculed. It's bitter. It's very bitter to be alone in the dark. The second reason we lose hope under terrible suffering, depression. Depression floods us, fills us. Verse 20, my soul sinks within me. Life becomes this heavy, heavy weight which is silently crushing you down, bending your back. The third reason, you pray. You pray and nothing changes. Verse 8, he shuts out my prayer. Psalm 22, David wrote, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. The fourth reason that we lose hope on your terrible suffering. Culture, the world around us tells us God is cruel. Culture tells us God is cruel. The unbelieving world, unbelieving people tell you, I could never, I could never worship a God who would cause suffering, who would allow suffering? I could never believe or follow a God who is angry and require a sacrifice for sin. I could not. That is a very specific form of unbelief. These people despise God's right to punish rebellious people. That is why they hate God. And that same feeling you, you may be tempted to have that. It's like the temptation of the serpent in the garden. You remember that. Is God really good? That question can fill us with doubt, with despair. But there is good news. Let's look at the end of terrible suffering. The end of terrible suffering. How can you have hope in God's goodness when his hand, his own hand, has caused you pain. You have to see Jesus Christ in the gospel. All the suffering, all the suffering in these verses, all of it was suffered by Jesus Christ. Verse 2, Jesus Christ is the one who walked in darkness. When daytime was turned into darkness as he was dying on the cross. 
Verse 5, Jesus Christ was besieged and surrounded by enemies like dogs. Psalm 2, they mocked him on the cross, surrounding him like dogs. Verses 6, 7, 9, Jesus was set in the dark place of the dead. When they killed him, they hedged him him into this tomb, hedged about by hewn stone. Verse 8, Jesus Christ cried out, but his prayers were not answered. He said, God, why have you forsaken me? But his Father did not answer. Verses 10 and 11, Jesus was torn in pieces when they lashed him with a whip stone and bone fragments. Verses 12 and 13, Jesus' vital organs were pierced, not with an arrow, but with a spear in his side at the cross. Verse 14, Jesus Christ endured the ridicule, the loneliness from his people. Thieves, religious leaders mocked him when he was dying on that cross. He was alone. He was abandoned by his friends. Verse 15, Jesus drank bitterness. Our Savior drank the cup of God's judgment and the vinegar on a stick as he died. Verse 30, they struck Jesus' cheek in reproach. He received two beatings before his death. The church leaders blindfolded Jesus and struck him. The soldiers crowned Jesus with thorns and struck him and then nailed him to a tree. When you look at the terrible suffering endured by Jesus Christ, you'll have one of two reactions. One of two reactions. First possible reaction is proud criticism. Proud criticism. You may say, I will not accept a God like that. God should have made the moral universe differently. I do not like this cross. The second possible reaction is profound surprise and joy. You see Jesus taking these blows and this bitterness, and you think, he endured all that for me? Sin must be punished. There are only two options. God must punish us directly, or he must punish a perfect substitute for the second person. Jesus Christ, your perfect substitute. The death of Christ was mercy to sinners who have broken God's law. And Jesus Christ loved you. And that is why he endured all the fullness of that suffering. And that is the reason we can have hope. Because God punished Jesus for your sin you can live with joy, peace, and hope. Let me leave you with this final thought. If you now are in deep suffering, how do you know that that terrible suffering will one day finally be lifted by the God of mercy and compassion and faithfulness? How do you know? When the scriptures talk about the sufferings of Christ, it links them, the sufferings of Christ links them to the glory of Christ. Not only in one place, suffering and glory, in 20 places, the sufferings of Christ will result in glory. And if you are united to him, in suffering, you are surely united to him in his glory. Romans 8, 17, we suffer with him in order that we may also 
be glorified with him. Maybe today you are being crushed. The morning is coming. And then you will be raised, raised up in glory by the God who loves you enough to suffer in your place. Let's pray. Oh God, we see here the cross. We see a terrible and a lovely place where justice and mercy meet one another. We praise you for your wisdom in saving sinners this way. We praise you for your love for a wayward people. And we pray for endurance and for hope in our deep sufferings. Convince us, convince us of the resurrection glory that we share in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.